I said, I'm in favor of benchmarks for indirect emissions. And as far as I have understood, please correct me if I'm wrong, there is a paper on the table by the Commission saying that we want to compensate also for the 10% best performers. That is, of course, you represent 100% of the industry, that's true. But I cannot accept that somebody who is 50% over the best performer, over the benchmark, says, please protect me because the rest of the world is not performing good. You know, when you are emitting twice as much as a benchmark, or sometimes three times as much as a benchmark, you will find companies in China that are doing better. So the carbon leakage argument is only valid when you are really the best performer. And that's why I defend this benchmark. And the question what we have to discuss now, the Commission will only compensate, as they have uh, proposed, 75% also for the best performer. That is my request to Joster Baker. Please be more flexible on this. There are some industries that, when they are best performers, they need 100% compensation. But these are the things to be discussed. And worsening the crisis, three times the European Council, the summit, has agreed on a wording saying one of the answers to the crisis is investment in the low carbon economy. So when you say we are worsening the crisis when we discuss this, how we can foster uh, investment in the low carbon economy, that we need to find a way to do this. Uh, if you say that is worsening the crisis, you need to go to Sarkozy, uh, to, to Merkel, to Cameron and convince them. They have very clearly said investment in low carbon economy is a way out of the crisis. We need to do it in a right way and we need to avoid carbon leakage, but that was too blunt. We had a, yeah, a question over here. Yeah. Good afternoon, Valeria Lizano from Edison. I just joined, so maybe I missed some parts of the debate, but I heard again that uh, to some extent the, the failure of the ETS uh, is blamed on energy efficiency. And to my understanding, it was safe and sound already from 2008 that the figures on the renewables and energy efficiency were factored in the calculation of the target. So what we have or should be addressed probably uh, with the set aside is the crisis, which was unforeseen. Uh, we've seen the ETS react in a very interesting way to cyber attacks, and we still don't know who we should blame for that. And uh, other policy decisions, such as the decision on uh, HFCs for uh, other carbon offsets, which is basically saying that this is a very young market, very mature, which is reacting to some extent to market fundamentals and to some extent to other, say, triggers. Um, we keep, I keep hearing at least uh, that there should not be intervention on the ETS market. Uh, again, to my understanding, the ETS is not a market, it's a market-based mechanism, which is different than saying today for the energy sector we should put our hands on oil prices because they're affecting investments and uh, saying the same thing for the ETS uh, insofar as it is considered a market which is not in my in my opinion so um, today we would intervene um, by eliminating some allowances from the market to cope with the effect of the crisis tomorrow and there that in that case the industry will be right uh, we should intervene again say if for some reason for some uh, magical development the, the economic recovery should kick in again uh, and then we will be faced again with a problem to put back on the market this sort of uh, allowances missed because of the crisis um, so my question is for Mr. Delbeck but also for the other panelists uh, there is also, uh, together with the set-aside, an option for a more structured uh, way for uh, addressing these issues with the ETS, which is something similar to what we see um, by the central bank on the monetary policy, uh, some sort of supply management in order to cope with, uh, for the case of the central bank, interest rates, uh, for us it would be something that, uh, according to the will of the majority of stakeholders, determine the investments and the industrial strategies for the energy sector, um, taking into account also the fact that the ETS is not responding today only uh, to the market fundamentals of the energy sector, but to the market fundamentals of many, many other different actors which are acting on the ETS market. Thanks. <coughs> well, I uh, 
just would like to put for the record again that we in DG Climate Action are absolutely convinced that energy efficiency is the way to go. And when we were making the point at that is that we have to optimize the interrelationship between energy efficiency improvements and the carbon market. And I would like to, uh, uh, to warn for a kind of uh, uh, description as if we have either the carbon market or energy efficiency improvements. We can have both, and if they, but they have to be designed one uh, in, in line with the other. Uh, the other point is that at the time when we were making the, uh, uh, the, the impact assessment on the uh, EU ETS, uh, that means 2008-2009, the energy efficiency target of 20% was not incorporated into the impact assessment done at that point in time. That came later because it was not a goal comparable to the renewable energy goal or the 20% uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions objectives. That's why uh, that came later into, uh, into the equation when we made the proposal for moving to the energy efficiency directive. Um, on your question on whether we should have an analogy with the monetary policy and have a kind of carbon bank, um, the, the Commission is not convinced that we have to go uh, this way. Uh, because that is going to make a bet on how the authorities are going to behave. And if uh, instead of going on the market, we are going to have a lobby machinery on the Commission or the Carbon Bank making its next move to have a price up or down, uh, we will have speculation that is policy or politically driven instead of having a market operating and incentivizing to the clean technology uh, that uh, we need to have. So that's why we, we are very cautious in, in not uh, going into a regulated market. Um, I'm just going to try and get through, we have quite a few questions and we're going to try and get through them as quickly as possible and that depends on you asking very brief questions. No more long statements please. Mm -hmm. uh, gentlemen here. Um, hello, my name is Sandy Kumar from a, a think tank called E3G. Um, just a couple of points of clarification on the, the whole issue of competitiveness. We totally agree with Dr. Lise that if there is a genuine concern for an installation that faces competitiveness concerns, we should support them. But the European Commission has just recently reassessed the carbon leakage list and it's gone from 600 down to 10 sectors. This was done by a different department, it's DG Competition. I think that's a very important uh, fact which hasn't been picked up. So, so far, all of the information we've heard from Business Europe and their colleagues has been factually incorrect when we assessed can you ask a, Can you ask a question, please? Yes. The, you, the, quickly, please. The, and then we'll get through all the people. It's, it's unfair to other people otherwise. Okay, of course. Uh, my, my question is to Josta Mackey. Uh, you said that the Commission hasn't intervened in the market, uh, but actually the early auctioning regulation which was pushed through is an intervention. Um, can I ask you, uh, therefore, Will the set-aside be a reverse of the early auction? Um, and if the set-aside proposal doesn't come from the Commission, um, what other policies and measures are you looking at to achieve our 2050 targets? Quickly, if you Well, the, the set-aside, as I explained, will have to come on the basis of a proposal from the Commission, whatever it is the co-decision route or it is the comitology route. I, I, I do not see how the set-aside otherwise can be dealt with. And I think that that's also the orderly way to do it and the transparent way uh, to do it. Uh, you, you ask about the auctioning regulation and, and the fact that that was uh, a deliberate move from the Commission to organize the market. Of course, it's by definition. The Commission has to spell out what the timing and uh, pattern and the modalities are going to be uh, according to which the auctioning is going to take place. And so we did. And if there is a wish for a change, there will be a wish for a change through a co-decision proposal, and that then is going to be followed through the normal procedures. So I, I, I would like to take away the impression that all too many people have, as if the Commission is going to just overnight uh, organize a set aside in the dark uh, without any scrutiny from anybody. That's not the way Europe works. You know that, we all know that. We have a co-decision process, and if we would come to that point, it's going to be in the open and not in the dark. So I would like to reassure everybody about that. In order to get through the questions, let's just group them. We had two here, one here, one here, and one there. So I'll take those five. Um, keep your questions as short as possible, and we'll, that, that way we should be So, uh, lady with uh, dark hair, please. Thank you. Jessie Scott from Euroelectric. Since uh, my president and vice president said some strong things today and have been cited. 
Um, I think I should be clear, we don't yet have a position at Euroelectric, despite these powerful statements. Um, I wanted first to thank Jos for being very clear on three things. First, that there is an issue of coherence between the ETS and the energy efficiency targets. <coughs> Secondly, that there is debate is about the problem of supply in the ETS market. And third, that any correction in the form of a set-aside would concern auctioning allowances, not the free allocation. Given that, a question for both the rapporteur and Jos. Do you have a view on what's the optimal time frame for some decisions, some clarity about this? Um, the debate within the Euroelectric certainly has a lot of concern about investor uncertainty, and the term interference, some of these debates perhaps are increasing uncertainty. Do you think we have a year to talk about this? A number of months? Or okay, many okay. Years? I think the question is clear. So the gentleman next to you, yeah, Simon, who, Simon. who I hope is not from but. <laughs> Simon Blakey from Eurogas, so we have a neat, uh, a neat parallel there. I would like to come back quickly to the question of price management to Jost Um I think I heard you say that you're not in the business of price management. Uh, Valeria Palmisano raised an analogy with the oil market. When OPEC interferes with the supply side on the oil market, the consequence is management of the price. If the Commission interferes with the supply side of the ETS market, Surely the consequence is the management of the price. Would you get a comment? The gentleman at the back then. Thank you. Brian Ricketts from Euro Coal, representing the uh, coal industry. Um, the good news is that the ETS targets are being met, and we shouldn't forget that good news. Uh, so the answer is yes, uh, it is fit for purpose. So that's you've given us an answer, but, but not a question. The question is for Mr. Del Recker, who suggested that he would observe what happens in this House in terms of votes, reaction of politicians, and then the Commission would come forward with proposals. But if I'm not mistaken, the Commission has already made proposals in a, in sort of in a working paper. It'd be interesting to if you could explore that, uh, it split, seems to split Europe into two classes, high-income groups and low-income groups, and the high-income groups would have a, a reduction in allowances of, I think, 38%. So uh, if you could say a few more words about that proposal. And uh, two, more, two more questions here. Hello, uh, Therese Jerome from JDF Suez. I have a very basic question because I hear conflict, conflicting stories about this. Is abatement working or not? My experience is that it is, and it depends on the way you allocate it, uh, uh, allocations, really. Because power plants in Belgium, coal power plants have all closed by now. And I don't know why it didn't happen in Germany, but I guess it's about allocations. Hi, I'm Sandra from Alstom, which is an energy technology company. Um, I, have, I would challenge the nation that the ETS is uh, really delivering. Um, um, I don't know if anybody has any data on whether uh, or what part of the emission reduction is to be allocated to the ETS and what part is to be allocated to the economic crisis. Um, I also would challenge the nation that uh, the closing down of factories is only um, due to the ETS. Um, I would say from our sector, basically, um, we are a large part of the industry as well, and for us it's very important that there is a clear signal in terms of um, price investment into low carbon technologies. Um, the lower the price, the lower the readiness um, to actually invest in new low carbon technologies, and I don't think we have the time to wait around. Um, so my basic question is, um, how do you see the difference between um, the ETS really working and delivering the reductions and how much is actually due to the prices and also again the same question in terms of uh, when do you think it would be a good time to, to do something? Okay, so to quickly sum up the optimal time frame for decisions, is the Commission already guilty of practicing price management? Does the Commission want to divide Europe into high and low income groups? Uh, is abatement working and uh, is abatement working or is it the economic crisis and, uh, and also the, the time frame for decisions? Uh, I think most of those were aimed at Mr. Del Becker, but uh, uh, if the rapport. Okay, well, I can be relatively uh, quick on timing. Uh, well, as I said, we are monitoring what is happening in this house. This house basically holds the key to the timetable. 
Um, I, I would assume if something needs to be done, it will have to be this year, next year. I, I would hope that the economic recession is going to be uh, behind us as soon as, uh, as possible, but uh, uh, I cannot give more precise indications on that. On whether the uh, Commission is already managing uh, the markets, I, I hope I dispel that clearly. It's not the Commission, it's the co-legislator who is setting the, the targets. And that is also going to be the case in the future. So I, I, I certainly would refute that the Commission is doing that. And uh, it, it's, of course, a deliberate policy decision what the amount of allowances is that are being put on the, into the market. That's the target we are all agreeing. On high and low income uh, countries, well, I would like to remind uh, people that inside the climate and energy package there are significant redistribution mechanisms. Uh, poorer countries uh, in Europe receive much more uh, uh, auctioning allowances compared to rich uh, uh, income countries. And, uh, and I think there is uh, in the impact assessment that we did at the time for all those who are interested, uh, clear indications on that. Um, on the uh, question uh, whether uh, abatement works, well, uh, or whether it is allocation. Uh, well, I, I think uh, I would like to rebalance the question to, uh, to companies <coughs> and CEOs, um, whether the ETS made a difference, uh, because what I gather from the debate is that inside companies, people are asked what the impact is on carbon allowances, because carbon allowances have a cost now, which was not the case without ETS. And as it is a cost factor, we can have many different views, how cheap or how expensive it is. But if we talk long term, the, the longer uh, the, the, the long term is going to be, the more expensive, I guess, the carbon allowances are going to come. And we are temporarily in a, in a dip now. And on the question whether it is the economic crisis or it is uh, policy uh, doing that, I don't know. What I said in my opening remarks is that between 2005 and 2010, we clearly saw a significant reduction. Uh, but now we have a deep economic recession. And that's a question that is a valid question. Uh, honestly, we don't know. Uh, and, and, and we are encouraging academic institutes, including the Energy Institute of the Florence uh, University, uh, to look into that, because it's a valid question. Um, but it's a question I cannot uh, reply to uh, just, uh, just right now. Thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Lisa, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let all the panelists make them some quick uh, remarks and then just have a look. Yeah, first of all, I have been called rapporteur several times. I was never the rapporteur on the big ETS. I was always only the rapporteur on inclusion of aviation. And only one sentence on this. The noise that has been created about a problem <coughs> is not always corresponding to the, to the burden for the industry. Uh, the, C, uh, the, C, the chief of the European Association of Airlines told me last week that Ryanair, one important airline, have calculated the cost per ticket of the ETS. It's 25 cents. I repeat it, 25 cents for a big European airline. And uh, the figure for a long-haul flight from Europe to China is 1 euro 90. At the same time, airlines are paying, without such a noise, 170 pounds sterling when they fly from London to Shanghai or to another long-distance flight. Have you ever heard any debate about distortion of competition because of the British uh, national tax? Uh, I think there is a problem that when Europe does something, people think that it's easy to attack it's always um, good to attack Europe, you become popular, but the burden of national measures is quite more important and also for the industry. Let's work on a European solution and then abolish all the national taxes and fees and national measures that are teasing the industry. On the two questions, the time framework. And we committee with this big compromise supported by Almost all groups, only the, uh, the UKIP group didn't support it, but ECR, for example, did. We said that we want the set-aside to happen after the adoption of the Energy Efficiency Directive. It's clear that we have more clarity what is the impact, but before the next period. So there is the time frame, hopefully 
we adopt the energy efficiency directive in June under the Danish presidency, and then it's time to, to do the appropriate decision. Maybe we need more time, but please, industry, then don't come that we shouldn't intervene during the period. If you want uh, security, help us to find a solution this year. Otherwise, we will face other problems, but I definitely would not then give credit to the argument that say, now it's too late. So uh, you can tell me now, uh, we support you in 2013, but then I want to have it in writing and not <laughs> only some uh, promises. And the, the last question, uh, uh, the representative of Eurocall said, we are delivering the target. I want to repeat again, and maybe this needs to be discussed further. We won't meet our 2020 target when we don't do something with the ETS, because the ETS is designed for a period, and we have the assumption that step by step emissions will go down. But when we have this over allocation and start the over allocation in the next period, and we, we transfer it to the next period, we will have a problem even after 2020. So uh, we will not meet our targets. And that's a problem for the international negotiations. Our credibility at the international negotiation is also at stake. And that's another reason for an intervention. It needs to be careful, but we cannot ignore this problem. Okay. Brian, a few brief remarks and the same for you, Robert. Don't, don't try and answer all the questions, please. <laughs> Perhaps I'll just um, stick to um, whether the ETS is, is delivering. Um, let's just take a step back. Why have we got carbon pricing and why are we trying to get to a low carbon economy? Um, it's to stop uh, catastrophic climate change and it's for Europe to lead because, believe it or not, we are the historically the most polluting nation on the planet. We contributed more of the backlog of greenhouse gases than any other block. So um, it's, it's morally uh, our job to sort this out and we've got to lead from the front. We can afford to do so. We've got political will to do so and, and so, the, so we must do that. Now, believe it or not, we're not going to solve climate change by reducing our emissions from 50% of Europe by 20 20% by 2020 compared to 2005. That is not the end game. That happens to be a milestone in this policy. This policy is here for the long term. It doesn't end in 2020. It carries on and its job is to deliver a low carbon economy in Europe. And as Peter's pointed out, the way it's constructed at the moment with all of the, the hot air in the system, we are in very great danger of allowing emissions to continue to rise actually to 2020, not to deliver a reduction. So. Uh, Let's not, you know, sit on our laurels and say, oh, it's doing what we thought it would do. What it has to do is a job over 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and that's to get to zero emissions. And uh, it's not fit for purpose at the moment. It can be made fit for purpose. It's an amazingly flexible policy. There are all sorts of ways of making it compensate for uh, unintended consequences on industry. Let's not pretend this is killing industry or deindustrializing de Europe. It can actually help. Europe to reindustrialize in a green way, we can decouple growth from emissions. That's exactly what the policy is designed to do. Let's fix it, let's let it do that job, and then I think we'll all be, in the long run, uh, winners if we do that. Okay. Robert, very briefly. Okay. The, um, it is already said that the, the this crisis now, if, if a 5 euro or 10 euro cost is a problem, a 20 euro cost is even more a problem. It's not so difficult. That will just be it's more difficult for a company. So what you see is that Europe is not an island, and that's what you say, we have to like a low carbon economy for Europe. Europe is not an island, the rest will emit more. Just said China and India will just emit, to, go, to grow on. Europe for the rest will not grow on. Probably for, this is probably part of the problem. People start, people have to take that into account. Halsum is a very good example of that actually. Um, very briefly, Robert, very briefly. Well and I was time. very surprised by, by the all special awesome position because what we need, as a, <coughs> we all need, it's what you need, is we need new investments in Europe, not only for you, for all industries, for the power industry, for our industry, for your industry. And that's exactly what this policy is blocking, and, and it should not be. And of course, the carbon price is somewhere where the initial incentive is, but if your customers will invest more or will invest in Europe instead of outside Europe because you're not an island, then you will get more clients. Uh, but since the, the question is we're treating this as an island and not as a low global level playing field, your customers in my industries 
will try and, and, and see they invest outside Europe and import that to a poor market and you have all the import emissions. So that is a complete mystery to me, your position. So but we need the new investments in the industry for everybody. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Robert. Okay. Okay. Um, to wrap up, I'd like to invite David Hone from Shell. He's David is Shell's senior climate change advisor in the Shell CO2 team. David, All right. Thank sorry, you very much. I'm sorry for the being over time, but we did start a little late, and uh, and it was keen to take the questions. Sorry. So man. let me just spend a couple of minutes and uh, not hold everybody from the drinks. Um, so I think we've heard, you know, a very challenging question: is the is the EU ETS fit for purpose? Certainly we've heard that the system functions, it, uh, it drives compliance against the, the targets that are set, but, and that there are many changes coming with auctioning, aviation, um, and so on. But we've also heard, of course, that the price is very low. This is uh, causing problems with member states in terms of revenue collection. Uh, it's undermining the, uh, the, the perception of the ETS and that the oversupply could well be a permanent feature. And in fact, this is leading us really to, to what is perhaps a vicious downward spiral, that we have uh, member states looking at this situation, beginning to take their own specific actions, such as the uh, UK carbon price floor, such as carbon taxes being talked about. These will further undermine the ETS, driving the price lower, and so we end up with a situation that the ETS really doesn't function at all. And the, the questions facing us really is, is, is what's the purpose of this instrument? It, it's an artificial construction. It's designed to meet a cap against a certain expectation of, of um, supply and demand. But it's also there to provide a very clear price signal for industry to invest in technology and to begin to develop the technologies that we know are going to be needed in the 2020s, 2030s, 2040s. And so, so the real question facing us is, should the ETS be subject to supply-side intervention? That's, that's, the, that's the issue. And the interesting thing is, if you, if you go back, for instance, to academic literature, there's plenty of evidence and plenty of thinking on this subject that says, yes, it should be. This, isn't, this shouldn't just be an artificial construction where supply is set and left forever, rather there should be a mechanism to intervene. And in fact, we already have a mechanism. If we were sitting here if, and, and the price was 200 euros as a result of uh, a macroeconomic shock, there is a clause that would allow the commission to open up the system and consider uh, how to adjust that to bring the price back down again. But there's nothing on the underside to uh, to, to, to address situations such as the macroeconomic shock that we've seen as a result of this, the recession. So I think, to conclude, you know, we, this is an artificially constructed system. It's the system that we collectively created, and the one that we collectively created to drive us to the lowest cost uh, outcome to the emissions challenge that we have, but also to drive the technology changes that we know are needed. And so I think, although a wide variety of opinions are, were expressed, it, it's also clear that we need to restore the ambition to this system. And I think we heard that articulated very well from, from a number of the speakers today. We have to do that very carefully, and we have to do it with thought, but there is precedence for doing this, and there's precedence not only in the ETS itself, but in the academic literature that supports it. Without this, we have a panoply of alternative policies, and this is going to get worse and worse. The alternative policies will mean that Europe does deliver on its emissions but a reduction, but at a much higher cost than it could otherwise do. And that's the issue that really must face us now, doing this at lower, lowest cost and for the long term. Thank you very much. David gets to do the hard part and I get to do the pleasant part, which is to thank all of our panellists today for their contributions, to thank you for all, all for coming and uh, filling this very large room. We were, we were slightly nervous when we heard what room was available, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a very good turnout. It's very pleasing. I'd like to invite you to uh, a, a, a small reception uh, outside. I hope you can join us for that. And uh, just to point out to you that there are feedback forms on 
this event. If you would take a few minutes just to fill them out, it's very helpful for us uh, to get your feedback uh, uh, back and to feed that into planning for future events. And I would also invite you to go onto the website where you can uh, take part, uh, make your own comments on the debate. Thank you very much uh, to everybody and uh, thanks.